So we're going to be talking about 55 South Bank Boulevard um, as a case study and also um, just uh, in general uh, feasibility of extensions to existing buildings. Uh, so 55 South Bank Boulevard uh, was an existing uh, six-storey concrete frame building. So this is a render by the architect Bates Smart. Um, so you can see the six six floors of the existing building and then above that with the change in facade is the new build. So that's on the corner of that City Road and 55, uh, sorry, and South Bank Boulevard on, um, so it's just south of Melbourne CBD. Uh, so the 10 storey hotel extension was uh, done in cross laminated timber or CLT. Uh, so WSP's role on the project was structural and uh, civil design. So as Adam said, we did the uh, the concrete and steel design and then the CLT was done by a CLT specialist. Uh, so the we were involved from concept design until the end of construction and the options uh, that were considered in terms of uh, concept were concrete slabs for the extension, composite deck slabs and the CLT floors. Uh, the limitations were the capacity of the existing piles. So uh, when the piles were first installed, there were static load tests done and the geotechnical engineer this time around when they were looking at um, uh, adding additional floors, uh, they're able to use the results of those load tests to determine the capacity of the existing piles. And it turned out that the capacity was higher than the initial design um, so we're able to add additional load to those piles. What we wanted to avoid was adding additional piles. Um, so to do that, uh, we could limit the vertical load, which meant that CLT was the better option because it allowed 10 storeys of vertical load, whereas the concrete options only allowed six floors. So this is the uh, structural Revit model. So that's the existing building with uh, piled foundations, six floors of existing concrete framed office. So level seven, that's a new composite deck. So that was for the pool area and for the gym area for the new hotel. And then the other half of it is plant area. Then level eight is also a composite deck. Um, and that's a transfer floor. So that transfers the load from the 10 floors of CLT to the existing structure. There were three existing concrete cores, so one that you can see there, and then one in the centre, and then one around the south. And there's a new steel core to the northern corner, um, and then another new core, new steel frame core uh, to the south, which sits on the existing concrete frame, uh, existing concrete core on the south corner. So the typical existing floor. It's a reinforced concrete banded slab sitting on concrete columns. Uh, so there are three, there are the three existing concrete cores in blue. So they were strengthened um, to comply with the current earthquake standards. And then there's also the new steel core in that northern corner. So the, in terms of the lateral stability, we're able to use those three cores plus the new steel core, plus there was an existing um, concrete wall. Basically this area is office and this area is car park. So there was an existing concrete wall that ran through the building for those, um, for several floors. So we we're able to use that as part of the lateral stability model as well. Uh, so that helped in the, the lateral stability design. So the horizontal loads, they're obviously higher because you've added 10 stories on top. Um, so the the columns, some of the columns needed strengthening, not all of them. Some of them had, uh, most of them had spare capacity. So about uh, 60 to 70% of the columns had spare capacity. They were already oversized. So they didn't need strengthening for the additional vertical load from the 10 floors of CLT. Um, but for the columns that did need strengthening, the way that was done was uh, additional steel members between the floors um, and fixed into the face of the existing concrete column. Uh, so they were typically PFC members, so channels, 
um, which you can see in this photo, or in the basement car park, there were UC members. Uh, there were also equal angle members, members used in some locations. Uh, so with the uh, existing uh, office area, they were all um, occupied during construction, which made uh, it difficult to install the, the strengthening works, but it was why steel was used rather than say using an alternative like concrete, because to, to um, strengthen the columns using concrete, well, that would mean you could add like additional reinforcement. Um, it, it would have been quite difficult to do or impossible to do when you had people occupying that floor. Um, the other factor is that because it's an existing building, you can see when you remove the ceiling panels, there are lots of services that are running next to the columns that didn't want to that uh, the builder didn't want to disturb. So we had to uh, relocate a lot of the strengthening um, to suit the existing conditions and also to avoid things like existing joinery, um, doors, benches, that sort of thing. Um, okay. Uh, so this is the typical CLT floor plan, so the typical hotel plan. So the red are the CLT walls, the load-bearing walls, and then the green is the CLT floor slab, and the blue are the two new steel cores. There's also some steel work in the corners at the curved areas. Um, this is the level eight transfer deck. So you can see the CLT walls from the previous slide, so the red. They land on this composite deck slab. So it's a 170 thick composite reinforced concrete slab on continuous bond deck. So the purpose of this slab is to transfer uh, the numerous walls, um, the load from them to the vertical um, members of the existing structure. So the uh, there are new uh, concrete columns. These are 750 diameter concrete columns that run from level six up to the underside of level eight, so the, up to the underside of this new transfer deck. And they align with the existing concrete columns. So the purpose of the slab is to transfer the load from the walls into those new concrete columns. Um, so it's the steel beams, uh, they're typically 1,000 to 1,200 deep primary beams and 600 to 700 deep secondary steel beams. All the beams are continuous. So secondary beams are continuous across the primary members and the primary members are continuous over the columns. And the reason for that was to minimize the deflection um, of, the, of the slab overall. Uh, so this is the transfer deck with the first CLT level. Um, and in this floor, so you can see, sorry, in this photo, that's level seven there and then this is level eight which is the transfer deck so that's the first um, section of CLT um, and they're pouring the other half of the level eight transfer deck there. The other issue was that at, in terms of the strengthening was at level two there was an existing uh, reinforced concrete transfer beam um, so basically it spans between two existing columns and it has another column over the top running from level two to level six. Um, and so the, the transfer beam transfers the load from that existing column to the two um, columns either side. The problem was when you add 10 floors of CLT, the additional load means that the beam doesn't have um, capacity to transfer that load anymore. So a steel truss was introduced between level seven and level eight. Um, so this means that it transfers the load from the CLT walls, so the 10 floors over, to the existing concrete walls on either side. So that means that the, the column that transfers at level two doesn't get any additional load from the CLT extension. So that means that uh, the transfer beam is still carrying the same amount of load. So that's spanning about uh, 17 metres. Uh, the uh, the top cord forms part of the um, the the level eight transfer deck, and then the um, the bottom cord forms part of level seven. Uh, just to give you an idea, I think they're 500 deep and they're 350 deep. Um, an alternative could be uh, to strengthen the transfer beam directly um, using 
say carbon fiber or, or steel. Uh, the issues with that are uh, whether you can actually physically access the beam. So if it's in an office, then they're going to be ceiling panels. You might not be able to get in uh, to physically strengthen that beam. And the other thing might be um, if you're introducing steel, then that may impact the architecture of the existing building. Um, so the truss solution, it's at level seven and level eight, which is part of the new construction works. At level seven is a plant area. So it was able to fit into the architecture. So that was where that solution was chosen. Um, so with the, the new steel cores, there's the northern core, which is for the lift, and the southern core, which is for the stair. Uh, so they're both braced steel frames and the reason for that was for ease of installation and also to minimise the weight. So there is a new raft underneath the northern core and that spans between the existing piles. So we designed a new raft to span between the existing piles and again the intention was to avoid having to install new piles as part of the, um, the new works. Uh, so that's why the intention was to try and minimise weight in order to um, to avoid the need to add new piles. Um, in terms of lateral stability, uh, oh sorry, just the CLT floors connect directly onto the um, the, the steel members. Um, but yeah, sorry, the alternatives for lateral stability could have been, say, providing bracing. Um, between existing columns but that and as well as like the northern core where part of the slab needed to be cut out the existing slab it's whether the architecture of the existing building can be modified to suit the strengthening that's required uh, the so there were three concrete cores that were existing and they needed to be upgraded to suit the um, the increased uh, earthquake load uh, so the the existing walls generally had sufficient capacity in compression uh, but didn't have enough capacity in tension so again the importance of like similarly with the columns uh, um, it's really helpful to have capacity in the existing structure um, so the the tension capacity was uh, provided by installing McAloy bars that were fixed to the existing walls um, and so they were yeah so they were installed um, the other issue because it's an existing building is there were services around the core so a lot of the um, the McAloy bars need to be moved to avoid um, disrupting the existing services so the curved uh, hotel room uh, there's so it's the typical CLT floors, but there's steel on each of the corners. Uh, so you can see that's um, so the CLT walls in red, and then the steel columns in blue, and the curved steel beams that run in between them, and support the CLT slab or CLT floor panel. Um, and the reason for that was architecturally they wanted an open area uh, to, at that at that curved corner. Um, so which means that they didn't want uh, CLT walls uh, to interrupt that view. So that was achieved by using steelwork. And then just the feasibility of vertical building extensions. Um, so existing information, that was really key to this project. We had structural drawings that had the reinforcement, had the reinforcement detailing, which meant that we could, uh, it was easy for us to justify the existing structure because we had that information, um, the capacity, of the existing structure. So uh, with 55 South Bank, there were um, the columns and the walls um, had spare capacity, the, co the piles had spare capacity, which meant that uh, that minimized the amount of strengthening that was required and also the ability to install the strengthening. So for example, cutting um, parts of the um, existing slab, installing the column strengthening um, uh, and the demolition that's required. So all of them impact on the architecture and whether the um, existing structure uh, can be modified to accommodate those changes. So that's just a general overview of uh, the feasibility of vertical building extensions. And with that, I think I'll hand over to Nathan. So I'm Nathan, an associate at BizTech, and I was the lead engineer for the CLT vertical extension component of 55 South Bank. Uh, just to give everyone that's not familiar with the project a little bit of context 
around where it's located. Sorry, it's closed to stuff. And for those of you tuning in from interstate or internationally, uh, the project is located at 55 South Bank Boulevard in South Bank here in Melbourne, um, in Victoria, Australia. And um, the, the uh, building is sited right between Eureka Tower and the recently constructed 108, which is directly across um, South Bank Boulevard. This is some old satellite imagery, so it doesn't show it here, but um, I guess to the untrained eye, 55 South Bank at approximately 72 metres tall, 17 storeys, doesn't look that significant in relation or in comparison to the surrounding buildings, but it certainly is a noteworthy project in its own right and is currently the world's tallest mass timber vertical extension. I'll just show you a, an animation to give you a bit of a visual overview. <laughs> This is just a really ideal or the ideal sort of project uh, for CLT construction. Lots of um, walls with relatively short spans for the floor elements and yeah, repetition up, up the building. Um, Emma's touched on this, so I won't go into this in too much detail, but yeah, the, the advantage of using CLT for this building was to gain an additional floor uh, for stories in comparison to conventional concrete construction. So achieving an additional 10 stories in comparison to six. And of course, with the use of uh, timber, much more sustainable outcome as well with um, approximately 2,800 uh, tonnes of equivalent CO2 sequestered within that timber. Um, coordination, always really crucial for any uh, prefabricated building solution. Um, all stakeholders really need to work uh, in collaboration to achieve the desired outcome. And in this case, um, Atelier Projects, myself at VizTech and KLH certainly worked uh, very closely and extensively throughout the design, manufacture and uh, assembly um, phases of the project. Lateral stability. Uh, Emma went into a great deal of detail about this as well for the base building, but in relation to the CLT, um, like I mentioned, lots of uh, walls, multi-directional shear walls, creating a real honeycomb structure. Um, so lots of capacity or lateral capacity for wind and earthquake loads in all directions. Um, great torsional resistance as well for that uh, reason, which is also then great um, aided by the the steel cores on the eastern side of the building, on the right-hand side there. Uh, stiff floor, floor diaphragms with the CLT and given the um, relatively short spans and uh, close proximity of the adjacent walls, um, this isn't working too hard as a diaphragm by any means, but um, yeah, still easily transfers the loads to the, um, the shear walls. Uh, as I always bang on about, um, sensitivity analysis, always crucial for um, all structures, but for a structure like this, even more crucial. Um, very important to make the building more flexible in order to assess any um, second order effects, and then also increasing the stiffness of connections to attract more load and make sure um, the ultimate limit state is well covered. Uh, robustness. I've recently done a webinar for Wood Solutions um, focusing on robustness, so feel free to check that out. Um, 
specifically for South Bank, uh, some of the strategies implemented were continuous floor plates um, wherever possible, so floor panels spanning across multiple uh, walls, as well as staggering those floor panels to create redundant load paths and transfer loads in the minor direction to adjacent floor panels and then um, down the vertical load carrying structure. Also looked at uh, notional wall segment removal in accordance with the NCC and 1170. So removing um, segments of the wall uh, in various locations to um, validate the robustness of the structure. And with this, um, the CLT walls also acted as deep beams um, uh, for, for the levels above. So there was lots of uh, redundancy in the structure for that reason. Uh, this was, uh, actually it's worth noting here that um, all of the CLT is fully encapsulated with fire rate of plasterboard. Now it's my understanding that that has actually come about because the end user didn't want this building to visually appear any different to any of their other service department buildings. Um, and it will be a real testament once people um, start to occupy this building and um, use this to see whether they uh, can tell that they're in a building constructed out of timber. Um, it was also the first project to, in Victoria, mass timber project, that is to go through the building appeals board. So lots of additional work went into the robustness um, assessment as well as the fire strategy. Axial shortening, always really crucial for any timber structure, um, but even more so for one of um, this magnitude and you implementing uh, platform construction. So going through and assessing the shortening due to shrinkage, both parallel and perpendicular to the grain, um, elastic strain, creep strain for your sustained loading, um, joint closure, you're never going to get perfectly sort of um, flat surfaces on site um, for various reasons or slight misalignment. So very small gaps will appear, but as the building goes up and there's more and more load just from the self weight of the structure alone, these clo uh, are easily closed. So this isn't a big factor in the over overall axial shortening. However, um, one of the really crucial things for a structure like this is the support structure. So. Emma um, went into detail about the transfer levels at seven and eight. Um, and you're never going to have a uniform stiffness across these elements. So it's really important to um, analyze the base building and that transfer structure in order to see how it impacts the uh, superstructure or the CLT superstructure in this case above. So understanding the deflection and settlement of that structure is crucial. Um, now, things like castellated walls, for example, or these sorts of strategies um, were considered early on, but very quickly ruled out uh, for reasons I'll touch on in a second. But for those of you that aren't aware of what a castellated wall system is, essentially you're notching the walls and floor elements so that you avoid transferring any load to the um, horizontal floor elements, which for timber obviously is where all your perpendicular um, grain is and that contributes to the majority of the axial shortening. So you're transferring through your vertical elements wall to wall in this case directly. Um, however, some of the disadvantages are you've got additional machining. So there's time and cost involved with that. Um, potential transport issues as well. Uh, this animation here is quite simplified compared to what it probably would be in reality. Um, so with notching the floor panels, for instance, you might actually have to have some additional um, temporary transport stiffening in there that would then complicate the assembly on site. Um, it also then complicates somewhat the connection detailing, not as straightforward as just um, going continually along the length of the wall um, at nominal centres. That sort of approach, you have to uh, implement a much more structured approach to the detailing and with any sort of detailing like this, the joints have to have some level of tolerance. Therefore, these joints need to be effectively sealed for weatherproofing reasons, as well as fire protection. Um, we soon uh, were confident that we could easily overcome the challenges 
around axial shortening by implementing um, some other strategies such as this. So uh, with the interfaces at the, uh, between the CLT and the steel cores, for example, one of the approaches was to allow vertical translation. So as the CLT shortens, it can move vertically or down the building while the steel, which isn't going to behave in the same way and will remain fairly static, um, can remain in place. And it's um, during or towards the end of construction, it was actually evident on site. You could see that the fixings had started to move down. So the timber was starting to, to shrink and um, settle. Uh, another approach was for the panels that linked um, the northern steel core to the CLT. Uh, these were ramped down initially, so, um, and also uh, more, a uh, bigger degree of inclination towards the top of the building because the axial shortening is uh, cumulative towards the top, so it's more severe as you go up. Um, and the idea here is that as the CLT uh, shortens axially that these would flatten out and worst case slightly ramp up. So that was another strategy implemented there. Um, so some of the key takeaways, uh, coordination is really, really crucial. Um, you need to coordinate effectively between all um, stakeholders and all disciplines. Um, we're talking about, you know, mechanical services, all of that stuff, the interaction too with um, sort of different suppliers. So in this case, the CLT suppliers, KLH, and the steel fabricators and chop drawers to coordinate those details effectively. Um, yeah, it's really important to do that. And then, as I've just mentioned, special consideration required um, at the interfaces between the different uh, materials because of their different behavior. So I'll just show some pictures. So this is the what was the existing building. That's the uh, first panel being installed on site there on the left. On the bottom right hand corner here, that is um, an example of one of those connection details between the CLT and steel core, allowing vertical uh, movement. This is just during construction. And that's the uh, finished product there on the right. So thank you. I'll hand over to Rob. Um, my name's Rob De Brinkert. I the current uh, business development manager for Icon. Um, previously with Atelier Projects, who were the um, head contractor in delivering this 55 South Bank job for Hume Property. You can see the project team there, which has been touched on um, by both presenters to date. Um, probably a, a special note to Bait Smart. This is more of an engineering constructability presentation. Um, but Bait Smart, being the architect, um, played a huge role in, in, in the entire project process. And um, I've got a, a short video at the end of my presentation to show you some of the internals and externals of the finished pro, um, product. And Bait Smart really did an exceptional job in trying to incorporate a, a hotel layout within an existing footprint of a building, um, which was very challenging, but got really some fantastic results for the client. Uh, this slide has been put up numerous times, um, so I won't dwell on it too much, but one important thing to note is that the existing structure was completely occupied during the entire construction process, including demolition, and erection of the vertical extension, which plays an enormous part in the challenges existing for the uh, existing tenants, um, as well as the construction company and Atelier projects in trying to manage that entire construction process, as well as, as well as all of the strengthening to the existing structure, which these columns that needed to be strengthened um, existed within their workplace and all work had to be done around those existing tenants and manage that. So it was very challenging, but something that was a huge benefit um, to the client, being able to maintain those tenants during the construction process. Another point I wanted to make on this um, slide was the, the timber component of this job was purely selected initially from an, an economic and commercial perspective. It allowed the project to be feasible. It gave it the extra levels and extra hotel rooms to make the job 
a feasible project. And um, for that, it's very unique around the world um, where a lot of other timber structures are, um, are developed from an architectural sustainability perspective. Um, but this is a, a really good example. Our mass timber can actually be very, very cost effective and economical from a development perspective. This slide has also been shown a few times. Um, it's a typical layout, um, but I want to focus a bit more on the constructability challenges of this layout. Uh, you saw previously that the all, all internal walls, including the party walls and corridor walls are CLT with all the doorways pre-cut. So it creates a lot of challenges from a logistical and material handling perspective. It's not like a concrete, um, concrete frame structure where once you strip it, it's very open and you can load materials and, and, and move them around the footprint very easily. So what we had to do um, using the current layout is we had a different strategy in relation to the way we would build it. So I'm just gonna skip past this and go back to this slide, but from a material handling perspective, we worked very closely with Vistec to understand where exactly the props needed to go in the job where materials needed to be loaded. Now, these were actually loaded during the construction process and not loaded in after the structure was complete. So what this slide represents is um, fire-rated fire -rated plasterboard that needed to be loaded, certain services components, stud work that needed to be loaded in, and how they coordinated all of those materials as a head contractor between the prop lines of the CLT. So a lot of pre-planning was organised on this job in order to coordinate all that material handling to try to get the most efficient way of construction out of the project. So just jumping back a bit, um, and this was represented in Nathan's visualisation, we broke the footprint up into two zones. So zone one and zone two, and what that allowed us to do is cake tier the structure. We could only fit one crane on the job, and that crane was purely dedicated to the erection of the CLT in zone one, and then shifted to dropping bathroom pods in um, within that same zone. And I'll show some images of this as well. And then the tower crane moved onto zone two to do the exact same process. Then we were able to get a crawler crane on top of the completed slab on zone one and drop the facade panels um, from above and start wrapping the building as the structure was going up. So a lot of coordination was needed with this and it was a key part of the construction methodology. So here's some images that represent that. You can see the um, CLT walls um, on, the, on the left hand side have been installed on the, on the concrete transfer deck. You can see where the props are as well as all the material that's been loaded on sitting on critical path. Then that allowed the bathroom pods to be craned into place using the tower crane. Now, whilst that was happening on one zone of the building, on the other zone, you've got the image on the right-hand side where what that hook is, that hook's um, attached to a crawler crane, which is sitting two levels above and dropping the facade in two levels below. And this was repeated around the entire structure until we got to top out. An internal shot of what that would look like. So this shows um, the facade being, or a section of the facade being installed from a few levels above and materials loaded in. Um, you can also notice a step in the roof structure or the slab above that was designed um, by Vistec as a, uh, almost a band beam to take the extra loads of the facade connection to the edge of the, of the CLT. The original design had some glue lamb in that area and uh, that was able to be designed out of the project which was made it much more efficient. It was also mentioned that fire rate plasterboard was required on the job. And there was a couple of factors contributing to that. Nathan mentioned a few. Um, there wasn't a, 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 an original desire from the client to express the timber. However, this job um, is, is quite a challenging project from a certification perspective and the current regulations in Australia as a deemed to satisfy requires the, the, the timber to be encapsulated by 16 mil fire rate plasterboard. Now, um, it was fire engineered as a total solution because it was exceeding the standard 25 metre height that was a deemed to satisfy, um, but it really allowed us to push through the certification process and make that more efficient and not push the boundaries too hard because it, was, um, it wasn't a desire from the client to express the timber initially. I'm sure during the process they would look back and say it, it, it would have been good to be able to do that, but because it was such a pioneering job, a decision was made um, very early to take the path of least resistance in certification 
and go with a full encapsulated solution. Um, in addition to fire, acoustics was also a very important um, detail. And what you can see here is two images of the party wall between the um, hotel rooms. And the strategy was a CLT wall structure um, a wall panel installed with 16 mil fire rated plasterboard directly fixed with screw fixings to the CLT and then a false wall um, with insulation was installed just in front of that um, CLT wall and that was uh, enabled us to get both the fire rating out of the wall as well as the acoustic with the wall separation. Floors in a CLT structure are also really important from an acoustic perspective and we had to build up the internal floor levels of the of each of the hotel rooms in order to achieve the impact and airborne acoustics between floors vertically as well as flanking and what this image shows is the build up in the corridor and how deep that build up needed to be in order to have a smooth transition from the corridor area into the hotel room now that floor build up um, consisted of some insulation some rigid insulation and an mdf board to separate that insulation um, from an FC sheet that stood on top of that, and then um, a carpet tile or a, um, a, a ceramic tile on top of that. I also mentioned before about the uh, facade connection. A lot of work went into this um, uh, with Vistex assistance as well as our facade consultant, but um, it was probably the biggest success of the entire project. We were getting um, significantly more productivity out of the facade um, installers purely because the the accuracy of the CLT and the ability just to just to physically screw the facade in the place was was extremely efficient and a huge success. Um, I want to also give a pretty big wrap to Vistec on their connection design. Um, what you can see here is is one of very few brackets on the project. Um, quite a uh, robust connection at critical. Um, load bearing walls and um, shear walls on the job but what you can see either side of that um, very very faintly are the screws so majority of the wall to floor connections um, and floor to floor connections on within the CLT of this building were done by stitch screws um, with the same screw spec all the way up the building and, and just simplifying the spacings so it was a really, really good design from Vistec that, that really sped up the installation process and kept the connections down to a, a bare minimum from a cost perspective. Um, probably the most efficient I've seen to date where a lot of the connections there are just pure brackets, which become really challenging from an architectural perspective, trying to hide those in your detailing. And we'll, because we had minimal amounts of brackets, we we're able to hide that in that false wall um, build up required for acoustics. Service integration was also really important. Um, the benefit of this job, it was a hotel. So once we solved a certain type of um, service uh, integration with the CLT, we were able to repeat it 220 times. The negative to that is if you got it wrong, you got it wrong 220 times. Thankfully, we got it right on most of the occasions. Um, and what we adopted here was a, a service box. Um, what you can see above the doorways is one service box that allowed us to um, group most of the services passing through the CLT wall as well as fire dampers um, into an entry and an exit point for the for the services so that was all fire tested and certified as well so it worked really really efficiently um, and all of those penetrations were pre-cut by KLH um, in Austria um, once the 3D model was complete so there was no trimming required those penetrations were already there and, and slotted in perfectly with the um, pre-selected dampers and fireboxes. As I mentioned, KLH were our um, CLT partner on the project. Uh, a fair bit of due, due diligence had to go into the shop drawing process um, as well as actually doing our quality checks over in Austria. I was lucky enough to spend some time over there with KLH doing that, which was fantastic, um, but gave us an opportunity to review and make sure at critical parts of the project that what was happening in the shop drawings was actually being delivered and manufactured um, and, and everything went absolutely swimmingly. What you can see here is a standard um, container load on the far left, which is the majority of floor panels. Um, and all the wall panels have to come into uh, come across in an open top out of gauge container, which is what you can see in the middle 
and the right hand side, um, which is a tarp over it. And that's because the floor or the, the height of the CLT walls exceeded um, a standard container size. So we, we ran with a 2.95 width or height of CLT wall and they had to sit in that open top out of gauge container. So all of that needed to be coordinated as well. I mentioned before the project team, um, but I wanted to link that to the certification um, of this project. In Victoria, there is a, a unique process of certification for timber buildings that exceed the deemed to satisfy and over 25 metres. It needs to go through an approval process that involves the, um, the fire brigade, um, obviously the local council, but the building appeals board um, and contribution by the Victorian Building Authority. Now, this was the first ever job to go through that process in Victoria and the only job to date to actually be approved by the Building Appeals Board. Um, and Atelier Projects, as well as all the consultants, worked very, very closely in an early contractor involvement. I like to say an early, early contractor involvement um, on the job where a lot of the design had to be done up front um, and understand the certification process so we could get it through the quite extensive process that exists through the BAB and VBA and MFB in order to get the project certified. So um, we were very su successful in doing that. Um, a lot of it was off the back of scientific fire services contribution and service from a, a, a um, building surveyor's perspective, but also Vistec, um, a lot of their robustness analysis um, had to be incorporated into our reports to the BAB. A lot of testing also had to be done in order to achieve that certification and all of that was done and incorporated into our submission to the BAB just to give a lot more robustness to our submission um, and also to give us the, the necessary quality requirements to make sure that all of our uh, penetrations were certified and incorporated in the right sizes into our 3D model. So that early contractor involvement was really important to allow us to get all this stuff sorted um, to get the job certified, but also for the shop drawing process. Okay, so just to finish off, I just wanted to show you a video. Um, and it gives you a visual representation of the life of the construction process. So what you can see here is um, the, the steel transfer deck that's being erected over the two levels. Um, and that's where the pool and gym went. So it's a bond deck composite slab as explained previously, um, that was poured and complete. And then the CLT elements were then erected directly onto the concrete and further up. So it was quite a logistically challenging job, very tight with only one crane. Um, and you can see the height that we needed to extend those CLT panels up. And that only increased, obviously, as we went further up the building. We also had... Dynamic pods as a partner for the for the bathroom pods, um, which also were, were, were dropped in on the critical path. And you can see that cake tier strategy, how one level goes up, then there's the second zone is next to it and how the facade is wrapped as you go up the building. So this allowed us to achieve water tightness as quickly as we can until we got to the roof structure. Um, these are recent footage of, of the completed um, product um, and full credit to, to Bait Smart and Hugh Property and their client in Adina uh, through Toga Far East and in the level of quality that was achieved in, in the end product with the pool area there within the steel transfer deck. There's some shots externally of the, of the finished product, um, which looks, looks fantastic. So that completes my presentation. Um, thank you, and oh, we'll shoot into questions. Thanks, Rob, Nathan, and Emma. Uh, congratulations on this project. It really is amazing. You've done something really pushed the boundaries, and it's uh, yeah, incredible finished product. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of different questions. Just a reminder for everyone watching, you can leave your questions in the Q&A and also upvote the different ones that you like. I've got first one for Emma. And there's a couple of questions around this. Was the building uh, designed for a uh, six-storey extension or 10-storey extension in, in the first place? Uh, I don't believe it was intentionally, although some of the, like we said, some of the elements had spare capacity some of them did require strengthening so at 
no, we, I don't think it was intentional that could take the additional floors. And uh, a few other questions around, was there any uh, testing of the existing building in addition to looking at the existing drawings to find that extra capacity? So there was uh, testing of the, there were core samples taken of the columns and the core walls, um, but the testing results didn't give us that, um, didn't typically give us that additional uh, concrete capacity in terms of compression that you would expect, um, which is, it may be due to either the testing or the, the location of where the, um, the, the core samples were taken. But that, yeah, the, the samples didn't give us more capacity than what was indicated on the drawings typically. Yeah. No worries, Nathan. I've got a question uh, coming through in regards to the, the shortening from uh, Matt Smith. What was the, was it the, the design shortening that you were expecting? Was that quite similar to what you actually experienced on site? Um, yeah, so I've meant, yeah, I think I've answered the question there. But um, yeah, on average, about three and a half mil per floor. Um, now that varies based on the location, but on average, it was around that. And then on site, obviously, it hasn't been, um, well, all of the axial shortening hasn't been reached yet. Um, I would expect that the majority would be sort of realised within the first few years. Um, but certainly some was, as I mentioned, uh, during construction. And that was due to once you had the sort of facade um, encapsulating the building and um, protecting it from the elements, uh, it certainly started to dry out. And, yeah, I, I don't know the magnitude on site, but at the core might be in the order of 15 millimetres max that you would see towards the top. Yeah. Fantastic. I've got a question here from an anonymous attendee. What are the fire engineering challenges? And then uh, Travis Sterling from Arup uh, followed up with, how long did the BAB process take to navigate? And uh, who pushed this straight through to the, the BAB or the building, uh, the building surveyor? So Rob, you might want to answer that and also speak generally about, um, you know, the whole process to get buildings like this uh, certified and across the line. Yeah, okay. So um, it was required by the MFB. So the MFB assessed the project um, and they said it's it's out of our, I wouldn't say jurisdiction, but it's out of our capability of certifying a project of, of the magnitude in mass timber and therefore had to go um, to the BAB. So really the MFB deferred the project to the BAB um, and the entire process from lodgement to actually getting um, a, a documentation formally was was almost 12 months. So it was mm. about 11, just over 11 months. And a lot of the jobs that are going through that process to date are tending to go down that similar sort of time frame, somewhere between um, probably nine to 12 months to go through, which is a huge challenge with timber frame buildings when you're trying to push the boundaries and do things a little bit differently and push the heights. It's, it is a challenge. It, it only exists here in Victoria. Um, and it, it, it has been somewhat difficult to try to get some of the other tr projects we're looking at um, certified. I've got a question here from Jason Lee. He asks, what was the acoustic treatment between the CLT levels and uh, was it a successful solution? So I might start with you on that one, Nathan, all about the uh, um, yeah, acoustic yeah, so treatment. Essentially, there was an acoustic wall to one side of each um, party wall, so to speak. Um, and then suspended ceiling as well uh, for the acoustic treatment. So, um, and that I believe was actually fully tested and validated on site anyway during construction. Rob, you can. Probably... Yeah, so, so the, the wall build up um, was as per the presentation CLT wall, uh, 16 mil fire check both sides, and a false stud wall with insulation and 10 mil plasterboard with an air gap. And the floor was the CLT floor with a insulation. Um, MDF board and FC sheet with the floor coverings and a suspended ceiling underneath. Um, and it was all tested and um, it was all well and truly over the, the requirements. And that, that is based on a AAAC acoustic rating, not deemed to satisfy. So your LNTW was a higher performing, which was a, a, a spec provided by Hume Properties client in Adena is, mm. is what their standard spec is. So um, it was tested for two-dimensional transfer vertically and horizontally as well as flanking um, and it 
it performed over and above to the point where we, we may have been able to take a la- out a layer or so, but um, it was a bit too late for that. And uh, the most upvoted question at the moment, why was the CLT sourced from Austria uh, rather than Australia? And uh, maybe start with you, Rob, given that you were previously at, at XLAM as well in, in Australia at the time. Yeah, it's probably important to note too, I was um, previously working with KLH as well prior to being at, um, at XLAM. So I, look, I know both um, suppliers really well. Um, and there was a huge push to try to get the product out of Australia. The unfortunate um, thing was that the, the, the factory up in Albury Wodonga um, was, was not ready at the time and, and XLAM weren't able to commit to the program requirements of the job. Um, and we were, we were constantly talking to KLH at the time um, as well, just to make sure there was competition in the space. Um, at, at the time, there was the preference for the client as well as us as builders was to get it locally. Um, but it just simply couldn't get done with the time frame. Um, and we, we were able to partner with, with KLH um, to be able to yeah, deliver the project. And, and it was a complete success from a CLC supply perspective. Mm. Um, what? got a question a bit more generally and it was somewhere in the questions, but they're kind of shuffling around a bit. And I might start with Emma in what are your thoughts on the feasibility on this type of construction, you know, timber on top of the existing buildings uh, going forward now that you've really done 10 stories, do you think there is a, an opportunity on loads of developments around Australia right, right now to follow this kind of model? Yeah, there is. I mean, yeah, the, uh, this project shows that it is possible. It does depend on the existing conditions. So like what Nathan said, how it was like a perfect um, in terms of the hotel, in terms of the layout, and also the existing building, having the capacity to strengthen it where it was required. So it does depend on those conditions, but the project shows that it is feasible. Yeah, we're certainly looking at, um, or have been looking at a number of projects, not of this scale, of course, but um, vertical extensions on, a, on top of existing structures and we're finding that they are feasible. Mm. Yeah, no, just, just to add to that too, Adam, I think, I think it's definitely feasible. Um, and it really is a sweet spot for, for mass timber and its ability to be lightweight. Um, it really comes into its own in these sort of applications because as soon as you start talking about 10 levels instead of six, people just aren't, don't start looking at square metre rates of a timber structure versus a concrete structure because it's mm. just, it's not part of the equation. So, um, and, and there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of evidence too about hybrid solutions in that space. So steel with, with timber flooring um, is, a, is a huge opportunity there when the existing layout may not be suitable for the honeycomb structure that exists on, on 55 South Bank. Um, and there's one in Flinders Street in Melbourne um, that Multiplex recently built. Um, that's a testament to that, which was supplied by XLAM. Yeah, absolutely. And that was using a steel primary beams and steel columns as well with the CLT sitting on top. So yeah, the hybrid solution can be very successful uh, to go down as well. Got a question from Nick Hewson. So we've probably got time for two more. So feel free to scroll through and see if there's any that you like, but with the challenges around moisture and CLT construction, are there any lessons learned from this project you would employ on future mass timber structures? Do you want me to answer that one, Nath? Or yeah, here you go. <laughs> Just, uh, just like to thank Nick for the question. Um, you're always in the ball, mate. Um, yeah, look, there, there, there were some challenges from a, a water management perspective on the job um, because it was such a, a I'd say it was such a large footprint, but the nature of the job, um, the main lessons learned from a water management perspective was, was making sure that um, we were charging up the building as quick as we could to get water tightness as quick as we possibly can. I think that's a, a lesson learned on any job. This job had a, um, a uniqueness to it where we, we, we attempted to load bathroom pods and materials on critical path, which means you get to the end of the building at lockup um, quicker. However, you don't get to air, the water tightness quicker. So um, a probably a lesson learned is, is focusing on the structure, getting the roof on much quicker. Um, and what was a real positive out of the job is it allowed us to trial significant amounts of water um, treatment during construction, um, some of which XLAM have, have started to adopt um, or, or suggested um, on, on other projects, um, certain ways of, of managing the water during construction to get, get out off the building. And that's from a constructability perspective. Um, 
and, and also managing the moisture of the timber itself and making sure that before you're locking things up and encapsulating it, the moisture content's at the right level. Um, but in a perfect world, I, I constantly get sent emails of, of images of a building in Scandinavia, which has got a tent built around it while they're building the building. Um, if we have to do that, it's, not, it's never going to stack up from our perspective here in Australia. And it would be a hell of a tent if it was on top of 55 South Bank. Um, so I think, I think we need to be practical about that as well. But the, that would be lessons from a buildability side of things. Yeah, and I mean, lots of testing has happened during construction and I've been a part of that myself and tested the panels for the moisture content. And um, once the building was sealed, it's now well below sort of your 12% anyway, so. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, it's just hit midday, so we might leave it there, but thank you very much, Emma, Rob and Nathan. And for everyone watching, feel free to show your appreciation in chat and I'll uh, share the chat function with the speakers today. So yeah, thank you so much. No worries. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Okay, so just a reminder for everyone who's joined today, it will be a formal CPD, which will be sent out by email at some stage today or tomorrow. And before you go, a quick plug of the Wood Solutions Timber Talks podcast, which is another uh, online resource that we can use. Uh, recent topics include an 18-story post and plate system. That was by with Carla Fraser out in Canada. So the production cycle of that was incredible. They did two floors per week. And uh, yeah, I highly recommend going out and listening to that. We've also dropping this week is prefabrication and passive house with Kate Nason. And in the last month or so, we've had the Wood Solutions in Focus uh, drop on YouTube and it gives you a real background on how the different timber products are made behind the scene, behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, I really recommend this also. So for next week, we've got designing for external durability with Chris McAvoy. So I really hope you can all join us for that. Uh, there will be a link to sign up after this webinar. So again, thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you next week.